Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the second day of the um, colloquium or symposium on human computer partnerships. And I would like to introduce Baptiste Caramio, who is um, a chargé de recherche at the at CNRS and at the um, Sorbonne University, and we've known each other for a while now, and I'm really enthusiastic about hearing your work that you've done at IRCAM, at um, University of Paris-Saclay, and also up at Sorbonne now. So. Thank you very much, Wendy. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for organizing this, this uh, symposium. Um, uh, yeah, it's an honor to be here and to, to do this talk today. So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I choose actually to, to talk about um, maybe more in progress or uh, recent work um, in order to, to fit uh, the, the, the seminar and maybe also to, to uh, produce some discussion uh, in this idea of uh, human-computer partnership. So I'm going to try to give some pointers towards uh, some works that I've done with uh, colleagues and students and postdocs around this idea of rethinking interaction with machine learning. I know that the title might seem very ambitious, but I, I, I mean, that's a, also a way to, to, to start discussing uh, what it means to rethink interaction with this kind of technology. And I will start by uh, showing you um, this um, image uh, that is an ecosystem of services and products uh, involving machine learning, artificial intelligence, or data science. And we see that it's very vast, and, and, and obviously this is not even exhaustive. Um, but this, this picture shows um, pretty well a landscape created by uh, this investment company. And it highlights pretty well how diverse and uh, transversal the technology has become uh, from application in infrastructure, and actually it resonates with some talks that we had uh, yesterday, um, and also uh, application in, um, in actually user, end user application. That's uh, where actually I situate myself and my, and, and my research. So more machine learning that is uh, deployed and used in application that are, that are then uh, embedded in mobile phones, in computers that are used by end users that are uh, usually novices in machine learning, that are not necessarily expert, or domain expert in, in another domain than machine learning. Uh, but the important thing is like uh, that this technology is actually brought uh, towards uh, the, the everybody. And so when we do that, when in, in, when we, what we can see is that uh, we can um, see a common workflow when this technology is embedded and integrated in end user applications. And I would like to stress uh, this workflow that works like this. So usually we have a system, a machine learning based system, that accepts inputs and outputs. And we have a series of uh, stakeholders like experts or end users. So usually the experts are the ones that are uh, designing the algorithms. So here is expert in machine learning on AI. So they are designing the, uh, the, the model, the algorithms. Um, they are tweaking parameters, changing the models, uh, changing the metrics. The threshold is like um, very iterative and very uh, time consuming work. And from all these experiments that they do, they receive uh, some metrics so to understand if actually the model works well or not. On the other side, the users, so this is the development side of the machine learning based systems. So on the other side, the users have interaction with the experts um, or the companies developing the, 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 the systems by, for, uh, for instance, sending feedback or data and receiving maybe questions from the company about the experience that they have with the, with the application. And eventually, the interaction that they have with the system is mostly uh, data providers. And, um, and so they, they, also, they only experience usage and testing of these, of these systems. And they are mostly not involved in the development of these systems. And 
I'm not uh, the only one telling that, but this uh, design is actually um, bringing many breakdowns or issues um, that I'm listing here, um, some of them. What we can see is that um, this design uh, doesn't really, or this workflow doesn't really prevent biases. So what we, uh, what we, see, what we have seen in the recent years and also with this breakthrough of deep learning and, and this spreading over like a lot of different applications is that biases are actually spotted when they are, when the application is already deployed. Uh, so we have this, we had this example given by Thomas Baudel yesterday about trans Google Translate, uh, translating from Hungarian to French with this uh, um, gender problem. We had also during COVID, we had this, uh, this computer, uh, this uh, biases uh, that have been spotted from the Google uh, Vision API where, for instance, the thermometer give, used to uh, test the temperature when it was uh, held by uh, a white hand, it was classified as an electronic device, but it w when it was held by a, a black hand, it was uh, classified as a gun. And that's a problem, obviously, but the problem is also uh, that it, uh, it's really uh, spotted at the very end of the, of the, of the, of the chain. So it does not prevent biases. Um, and so uh, it also prevents from uh, system auditing by the users themselves. So when you receive this kind of biases, people can react and basically is what happens and usually it's on Twitter, Instagram, or social network to make noise and, and that's a good way to do it. Um, but maybe we can think about like other way to audit uh, machine learning system by enable, for instance, like uh, exploration of this system, uh, trying to find edge cases um, and so on and so forth. And so this design uh, kind of block this type of auditing. Also, uh, I stress, and this has also been uh, illustrated by uh, in Theo's uh, Sanchez talk yesterday, is like this kind of design hinders ML literacy and democratization of the technology. In that sense that the user has no access to the system, so it's, it's not really easy for this user to actually understand what is uh, under the hood or how he can uh, or she can uh, develop her experience or uh, experience-based uh, skills about this, this type of systems. And so what we have is like mostly black box system that, have ex that are experienced by users. And also I believe that, uh, this, that this type of uh, design is also, uh, also reduces the robust deployment because one, one thing that we can see, and, and myself also uh, work in a, in a startup company developing AI systems uh, back in um, seven years ago in London, and basically when you test, uh, when you develop system offline and when you try to deploy in the, in the real world, the, the data are never the same. And so obviously there is a lot of problem of uh, robust deployment. And most, I guess, a lot of companies start actually to, uh, to, to develop some more interactive workflow in order to improve this, uh, this robust deployment. And of course, uh, this type of uh, design reduces transparency, as um, I already mentioned with the biases. So, um, the point in this talk, my point is actually, can we look to alternative perspectives on this technology and what we can learn from it? Um, and I will stress that, and that, we, that it's interesting to look at what, how artists or creatives are actually uh, looking and using and appropriating this technology. Um, actually, artists have always been uh, early testers, adopters, um, critics, hackers of technological innovation and how they use it and how they, they, they change it uh, or how they repurpose their um, their near original design is really interesting. So I put one image by uh, artist Memo, Memo Acten. Um, this is uh, back in seven years ago, and in, in this work, he used uh, a technique uh, developed by Mike Tika to explore uh, convolutional neural networks, to, to visualize uh, how uh, convolutional neural networks are actually uh, learning from images. So uh, this algorithm is, was called Inceptionism, and uh, so it's used here by uh, Memo on an image of the UK, uh, the government uh, headquarter, communication headquarter. Um, another example uh, is this work is by Kyle McDonald. Um, 
So he used this side, this, uh, this um, particularity of machine learning that is based on, on, on data set and huge data set and, and, and annotated data set to create an, an interactive uh, kind of surveillance website where people can annotate what happens in real time here in Trafalgar Square. And so in a way, it's like of disrupting with this annotation thing and by providing, uh, by opening this annotation process to anybody and also that would lead to completely uh, no, inconsistent annotations. That's uh, very interesting. Third example, uh, this is by Rossi Oberanger. Um, she's based here in Paris. And I, I put her word because uh, she took a, a different stance where basically here, uh, machine learning or AI, as, as uh, she called it, um, is considered as subject matter. So here in this piece, G5, interspecies, um, she imagined a kind of a submit where all each rep well, represent, representative of each of type of species in the earth is actually meeting in order to talk about the future of our planet. So we have animals, we have minerals, we have vegetals, we have humans, uh, and we have also uh, technology. So from this alternative, so what alternative perspective, I would like maybe to, to, to try to, to start to investigate how we could rethink interaction with machine learning. So now uh, I will uh, first, uh, in this presentation, I will first um, present a study that we did investigating more with HCI methods uh, more uh, thoroughly how uh, artists are actually involving machine learning and artificial intelligence in their work in order to understand their workflow uh, and many other things that I will present uh, uh, here after. Uh, then I will um, present um, another part of, uh, like from this, from what we learned from the artistic practice, with, I'm going to present um, a series of tools or a toolkit that will allow maybe, or that's a proposition, to allow to compose and design interactive uh, uh, interaction design with machine learning. And I will uh, give a third example where I will show maybe how we could use interactive gen generative model here in a clinical and medical uh, context, uh, stemming from what we learned from these two previous uh, studies. So I'm going to start with um, these uh, studies that we conducted uh, where we investigated how uh, artists are using uh, machine learning, or v here visual artists are using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, I used um, uh, one quote by, by Memo to, to describe himself like explorers of unknown planets. So this work um, is uh, in collaboration with uh, Sarah Dilielawi, and uh, we had also uh, like a, a workshop a paper with uh, Stacy Zwe uh, at CAI this year. Um, so this is a, I'm starting with these examples by Mario Klingemann. Um, so in this, in this work, why I should, I'm showing this work? Because this work has been kind of advertised, advertised, one of the first work that has been kind of, that entered the art, uh, contemporary art uh, market and has been uh, sold at Sotheby's. And Mario is very famous. He's kind of one of the pioneer uh, in the in the use of uh, generative models and deep learning based generative model in in visual art. And um, and Mario managed to 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 reach this virtuosity using this this type of, of technology. So here, you have like two screens, and actually, well, it's not an image. It's videos where faces are changing dynamically. Uh, and the, the model behind has been trained with portraits from the 17th and the 18th century. But what is really interesting is like this quality, this, this, this aesthetics that he managed to get with this technology that sometimes we refer to Ghanism, something like is like, uh, like really typical of this, this type of models. So, um, and so under the wood, um, Mario and the other artists that I'm, I will be presenting are using generative models, as I mentioned. So just uh, maybe a quick uh, introduction to generative model, what it is for those who don't, don't, know, who don't know what it is. Uh, usually train, uh, generative models are using training data like most of the machine learning techniques. That can be images, uh, text, sounds. Um, here is a painting by Gerhard Richter. Um, and so that, has, that are provided to, generate, to, to the generative model 
that would give an output, so something that should look like some, that what we have as a training data. Um, very importantly, there is at the, at the heart or the core of this type of model, there is a comparison function. There is something that tells you, okay, what, you, what you've produced looks like what I, what, I, what I gave you as inputs. And this comparison is used for, as, for the generative model in order to drive the optimization and try to, uh, to basically to generate something that is the most uh, similar to what there is at the training, uh, training data. And um, I mentioned it very quickly in the, in, when I was presenting Mario's work, but uh, at the, m most of the artists that I was presenting are using uh, this typical generative model that has been uh, uh, released uh, by uh, Jan Goodfellow and uh, the team at uh, Montreal, which is called Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN. So this model is eight years old. Uh, it has been, there have been a lot of, uh, it's one of the breakthroughs of deep learning. And so we talked yesterday about maybe transformers, but GAN is also one of the breakthrough. Um, and there has been a lot of different extension of these this models and actually it's also used in, uh, in privacy and security uh, uh, to, to build um, a very robust model that are robust to adversarial attack. So how does it work is basically, uh, it's a dual uh, learning system where we have on the top, uh, we give some kind of stimuli, like a Z, which is noise, that is given to a generator. So this is a deep neural network. And so this generator is producing an image. And then we have also a discriminator, which is the D, that receive images from the generator and real images, something that's, that's uh, the ground truth somehow. And these images are annotated fake or, uh, or real. And the goal of the discriminator is to be able to classify what is fake and what is real. So basically, the discriminator gets better and better at classifying real and fake images, but the generator gets better at fooling the discriminator. And so it's really efficient, it's really smart, and it gives a really good result in terms of, of, uh, of generative, generative image. So in this work, Anna Hidler is using this kind of, of, um, of, of model in order to uh, produce these uh, videos of tulips. Um, and here she, uh, through this video, she kind of uh, enacts uh, hidden stories behind tulips in the 18th and 17th century in, uh, in Netherlands and, uh, and, and, and the link between tulips and their cost on the market. Uh, I won't go into the details, but I really recommend to, to look at our work. Something that I would like to stress, though, is that in order to produce this work, uh, Anna Riedler produced, went to, to take thousands of pictures of tulips. So she built herself the data set, right? And in this data set, she also annotated all the, all the flowers and then feed this data to, uh, to the generative model. And so what is interesting in her work is that she's uh, um, actually presenting this as an artwork as well as the output of the algorithm. So for her, uh, basically the artwork is dual. There is the data set, uh, what is behind the scene that is usually invisible or anonymous, and, uh, and what is the output of the algorithms. And the two are actually telling different stories. Another example is by Memo Acten, uh, that I'll show at the very beginning, but I'm, I wanted to present this, this piece here. Uh, because it brings something really interesting for us as uh, HCI researchers. So in this piece, we have, uh, so it's called Learning to See. We have two screens, uh, and we have a webcam on the table here. So basically, the screen on the left is what is picked up by the, by the webcam, and the screen on the right is the output of the algorithm. So the webcam takes the images that is, that is given to the generative model, and so this webcam feed is actually driving the generation. And it, so this is uh, what it provider. There's a bit of sound, so I'm going to put the music. So again, on the left, there is the webcam. On the right, there is the generation. Sadly, one Sunday, I waited. Like my heart were all broken 
Just turning down the music. So what is um, fascinating and also very interesting here is this, how Memo built a system that, that allows him to perform the machine learning system. So here is really performing, he's really trying to explore uh, this stimulus space, this latent space through, uh, through webcam, but he did also other works in this idea. And he can change the kind of environments, like it was water and rocks, and, and then just by switching the model, you can also uh, create really different types of, uh, of aesthetics. So um, what we wanted to do with this study uh, is actually, yeah, is better understand how do artists involve machine learning in their art practice and how does this technology influence their work in their social, social cultural context. And uh, for that, uh, actually, we use the term terminology AI. Um, so you will see that in my talk, I won't talk much about AI, and that can be discussed. But it, for, this, for this work, we actually use the, the, the terminology explicitly. And AI was considering as two ways. Like first, as a, as a technique. Uh, it's as a discipline that is studied in computer science, information science, or statistics. And in particular, here in this work, AI refers mostly to machine learning and deep learning. So here, AI is an inductive machine. So it means that it's kind of, it produces that the program that is able to give some outputs and is driven by data. But in this work also, AI is, uh, is considered uh, as a cultural object in a sense that uh, we also try to understand how the artists are taking uh, or I can kind of um, integrate in themselves and their work also in this uh, culture that has long imagined other type of other forms of intelligence. Um, in the literature, in movies, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So here, uh, AI is a cultural object because also the modern conception of artificial intelligence uh, is actually derived from this culture, this idea to have uh, a general intelligence, something that is suprahuman level intelligence, uh, comes from this, 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 this culture. And also, we wanted to stress in this study that uh, AI, as understood, is an implicit cultural vehicle. Basically, by, f by being fed by data that has themselves curated and basically chosen by, by human uh, as these cultural biases or these cultural footprints, let's say, and let's not talk about biases here. And so in a way, it's a kind of conveyance, kind of, a, kind of a summarizing or extrapolating this kind of cultural um, uh, backgrounds that are used to, to build them. And so, um, based on that, we interviewed this, uh, we interviewed five artists that are world uh, renowned uh, Memo Acten, J.K. West, Mark Engelman, Kyle McDonald, and Anna Riedler. Um, and I will present uh, some few findings to give you an idea what, what we found um, uh, through these this semi structured interviews. Uh, first, um, I would like to, to maybe to present the, the typical workflow. So, this is really low level. How they, how they work with, the, with machine learning uh, or artificial intelligence. Uh, so here is, but for instance, um, we have uh, basically one algorithm that has been released, so here is a style GAN uh, that has been released on archive, uh, so uh, the paper has been released, then at the same time, uh, the authors release the code on GitHub, so this is quite uh, common in the AI scientific culture, is like uh, you have a lot of um, Often the code is released with the paper, and often the paper is released before being published in conferences. It's published on archive, which is this uh, uh, open repository. So it's really fast. Um, and we have some examples of how it, what it does. Like uh, here, there are images that you can find from this GitHub link, uh, examples of what StyleGAN is able to generate. And so artists, basically, what they do is they kind of clone the, this, this, uh, this repo, this, um, this library, and usually they start by running the model, like off the shelf, like let's try to, do, to, to, to see what it does. Um, and retraining, uh, maybe with, uh, with like uh, replicating basically the result from the paper somehow in their own way. And very quickly they start this loop where they use their own data because that's what they are, they are looking for. 
And here there is like all a um, circle between using their own data but also changing their architecture or the parameters. And in order to provide something that looks like what they, what is their, their aesthetics and, and, and what they would like to do with it. And so this is quite important because this is kind of the workflow, kind of the, 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 the practice of hackers in a way. It's not here, machine learning or AI is not used as a service. Uh, is reappropriated. And what we found is that um, basically the, the artists are actually talking about machine learning as a, or the, the, the work with machine learning and, and artificial intelligence as a, as a craft practice, crafting practice, craft practice. So here I put the, the work by Anna Riedler, uh, Myriads, and I give a quote from her um, that I'm gonna read. I actually think that there are a lot of parallels between craft and art and between data and models. I think that there are a couple of things like the relationship between craft, which is anonymous and less well regarded, its repeated nature and, and, and the art. And when you see data sets, data sets uh, are also anonymous and nobody talks about them. They are out there and people are using them. So she makes this parallel between, um, because for her, like building the data set is a craft uh, practice. Um, and it's kind of, she makes the parallel with the AI uh, scientific culture where data sets are mostly uh, anonymous, although they are open and they are, they are, uh, they are available. Another, another aspect is that uh, uncertainty is meaning making, and uncertainty is used, is, is embraced. So let's take this quote by Mario. Um, it so this is a piece by Mario Kingerman, and he says, uh, it, reminds me, it reminds me of Francis Bacon. In fact, in fact, no, I feel closer to him. There is this work with, with oil paint. He looks for accidents. That's exactly the point. When you work with oil paint, it also has this certain behavior where everything mixes. So you can't deliberately push in a certain direction. That's what he says. In working with it, there comes at a time when there's certain constellation is right. Then you stop, and you also have to decide, is this the best solution? Should I work on it? And that's what I found when I'm, when I'm in my work, keep training, and you may destroy it, everything. You may destroy everything. So it, it makes the parallel between like working with all paint and working with machine learning in terms of training. And actually, some of them said there is always too much training in their work. And lastly, um, that's something I already mentioned, but I think it's really important that this idea of performing machine learning, uh, and this is a quote by Memo Acted, um, that he says, I don't want to worry about which optimizer to use or which activation function to use. This is for neural network. I want to be in a position where the research has been done. Right now, it's kind of like if an article came out one day and said, don't use this optimizer because it's so bad, you should use this one instead. It's very frustrating. So because his approach is much more experience-based. It's not like he doesn't want to know which, if, which, if he should put ReLU activation in the in the last uh, uh, activation layer, no, he wants to, to be able to have a more sense of, an experiential, experiential sense of, of, of the models and experience it like this. So basically from these uh, studies uh, that I, I gave like snippets of it, uh, uh, I think what is interesting is this idea that, um, this idea of shaping machine learning. Um, and the fact that artists reinvent the narrative of this technology, basically they, uh, in a sense, they, 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 gave, they gave space to surprise, to uncertainty that is usually kind of limited or framed in the AI scientific culture. Um, and in, in their case, they are using it as a material. That's part of the, that's part of the work. That's part of the tool that they are using. <clears throat> and they are also uh, creating interactive processes to better appreciate them. So that's really important. That's really important. So in a sense, they kind of resist an epi epistemology uh, sometimes dictated by the AI uh, scientific culture, and they are trying to bypass that. Um, something interesting also in the sense of shaping AI is that they, because often we can say, oh yeah, but who is the author of the piece if you are using a generative model? And actually artists, they do not question authorship, obviously. For them, it's not a question. Um, why is that? Because basically uh, they found, they, for them, uh, the artist is the one that makes it happen, right? So 
um, they, when you see an artwork generated by, uh, by a generative model, by machine learning or AI, um, they know that it's their work, or they, 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 they convey their aesthetics within it and their, and their intention and their expression. Um, so the problem be then became when it's actually released uh, in, the, in the contemporary art market where actually communication uh, kind of buys uh, this, uh, this, this discourse, this narrative. And in a sense, uh, the third point is like, um, artists have also a political voice that creates an alternative and critical discourse. And this is important that to come back to what I'm sort of saying at the beginning, that provide this alternative maybe perspective on how machine learning or AI is actually, uh, can, can, can actually be used. Um, so uh, from this uh, study uh, that was um, based on the interviews, uh, I would like to uh, to go maybe in in, in maybe on the side uh, slightly more technical of, uh, um, but in a way you will see that is related to what I what I was just say before. Um, so now becoming like back to HCI researcher. Okay, as HCI researcher, we are conducting interviews to understand uh, some phenomenon, and we are also designing systems. And in order to design system, you know, to probe them, to test them, assess them. Uh, we need tools. And I would like to stress uh, the importance of the critical aspect of having tools that are, that are uh, uh, suitable for, uh, for composing and designing tertiary machine learning. Um, so this work is part of a discipline, sub-discipline in HEI, it's called interactive machine learning, um, which try to uh, basically um, build uh, interaction designs that uh, involve the user in many uh, steps of the machine learning pipeline, um, which means that the user is able to uh, select features, uh, is able to, she's able to uh, select a model, uh, change the metrics, so the quality assessment there on the top right, uh, steering the model while he's, while he's training, decide when to terminate, so that's uh, maybe remind uh, as uh, the quote by Mario, so when to, when to stop training. It's not necessarily an easy question. And then also the transfer, so when to, to deploy it and how to deploy it. So here, uh, the point is like, the end user is somehow can have access to all these different aspects. So the interactive machine learning research is quite uh, uh, developed in, the, in, the, in, in our uh, discipline. Uh, this is really not exhaustive, uh, but uh, I would like just to show a few examples of what we do. Uh, so from the kind of seminar work by uh, Fails et al, uh, that has 20 years ago now, almost, um, trying to use interactive machine learning to um, build a segment image segmentation um, system by just providing um, with the pen, by just providing a notation where to where is the foreground and what is the background. And so through iteration, you can build a segmentation system quite uh, easily and uh, without not so much technical knowledge. Then we have the Wikinator that is uh, developed by Rebecca Fibrink, uh, which, is, which has been uh, used and proposed for creative application. Uh, so uh, providing uh, the artist with the capaci capa capacity to kind of explore gesture, gesture sound interactions um, without programming. Then there is uh, uh, some work from uh, uh, Wendy's lab, uh, uh, led by Joe Malloc, uh, field word and password that has been shown yesterday uh, for gesture design. And uh, last example that I'm showing is uh, um, uh, a work by, the, by Fred Oman from Apple that, is using, that is, has built this kind of uh, interface that, uh, that help ML developers to build a robust model and then give some kind of versioning um, to kind of uh, track all the changing in the data and the parameters in the feature selection in order to be able to build the best, best uh, model. So this is not exhaustive. Uh, uh, Theo's work that he presented yesterday is really part of also in interactive machine teaching is really part of this uh, interactive machine learning research uh, as, you, as you will see. And what I would like to show is a, a toolkit that we developed uh, with Jules Françoise and, uh, from Paris-Saclay and, and Théo Sanchez, that is called Marcel. And the idea here is like we realize that uh, we are lacking a, a tool that 
enable us to build interactive machine learning uh, system easily somehow and something that is expressive and versatile. And actually, we develop it first for pedagogical reasons because we are giving this, this uh, course at University Paris-Saclay on interactive machine learning. And in order to convey the concept of this discipline to the students, we didn't find the right tools. Um, it was easier to uh, close, the, like the Wikinator, very good tool, but you couldn't really change it, or uh, really to low level, uh, which means like Python library, for instance, that, uh, that requires uh, programming language skills. So we developed Marcel, uh, and we developed it through an idea of architecture model that is based on components. So the idea is like, if I want to build an interactive machine learning system uh, that is able to generate image or to classify things interactively, maybe I would like to like, define a set of components that will define my, my, my system. For instance, a webcam input, a button, uh, to, 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 to capture data, a data set to keep the data, a classifier and prediction. And these um, components have, uh, not, not all, but have like uh, uh, interfaces that then we can uh, compose. So the idea is like to be able to, uh, on demand, compose uh, the interface with these different components. And these components are kind of um, uh, connected uh, between each other. So what we have is like, uh, there is a bit of programming uh, in JavaScript. Everything runs in the, in the browser. Uh, in this example, you have like a sketch pad, something to draw. You have a data set. And in this video, which is accelerated, basically uh, the user is adding a training button that is, that is linked to a classifier. So when you push train, it uh, triggers the, the training. And very easily, you can add uh, some kind of uh, classification plot, some confidence where you can inspect the probability of recognition. So this is really fast, but it's to show you that basically how it works is like you program uh, a script that is directly uh, executed in the browser. So it runs in mobile phone, it runs in computers. So what we can do with that is that we uh, first use case uh, is actually um, a part of uh, Theo, Theo's PhD is to uh, imagine that you are an HCI researcher that would like to, to, to do some research on the interactive machine learning. So with that, you can build your application quite easily. Uh, well, you need to know a bit of JavaScript, but it's quite a, it's higher level than JavaScript. And there is like a, with this component-based architecture. So here, uh, Suzanne is actually building a sketch recognizer, uh, building a script uh, with some kind of data set, a model, and, is gonna, and uh, she's uh, deploying this uh, system to, to the crowd. And so this is a workshop that we did that Theo showed already yesterday. Uh, but something nice is like uh, after the project, maybe, uh, so this works, but I said that's a research project. Uh, there is like Shan who comes into play. Where he, oh, Shan is a designer and basically he said, oh yeah, I would like to use your, your, your system, but to put it in the exhibition in the museum, like a pedagogical exhibition. And so, the work of Shan as designer, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to change the, the script. The script remains the same. It just has to change the, the interface. And since it's HTML, CSS, and it's quite, it's quite easy for a UX or UI designer just to appropriate the system and build an interface. So it's what happened with the, with the, sketch, the, uh, the sketch recognizer that is now shown in, uh, for one year and a half in Rennes and Nantes. Um, Another aspect of this tool is like another use case uh, is like if, since uh, uh, we can basically create different interface based on the same machine learning pipeline, we can imagine uh, that is foster collaboration between ML expert and, 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 and or AI expert and domain expert. So in this example, basically we have a, a machine learning engineer and we have a domain expert. So the machine learning engineer is building the model, best robust model, and then is deploying or she's deploying the model to the, to the domain expert, who in turn can actually correct the prediction and maybe uh, um, make the, the model more robust. So this is a kind of a, a very quick uh, illustration. So usually ML experts have uh, their workflow in Python, so it's what we saw. This is the interface of the expert. Uh, she can use, she can choose the, the model that has been trained offline, uh, in, monitor the, training loss, the confidence matrices, and so on, trying to find the right epoch. 
uh, test in real time the prediction. So this is an example in skin lesion classification. Trying to do some batch testing to inspect the, the, the confusion matrices. Also inspect different models in parallel. So just by changing number of models, we can kind of re in real time having uh, a very uh, customizable interface. And the thing is, once uh, the model has been trained and is robust, uh, basically the, the, the expert can, can, use, can choose to share the model to uh, the expert. So basically here, behind the hood is exactly the same pipeline. It's just that the interface is different and the model has been updated. So now the, the expert can actually also navigate, explore the model, but also correct if needed. OK, this is not the right prediction. So you correct, then the data might be updated and the model can be updated. And so with this, with this kind of workflow, much more interactive, we can actually uh, make uh, the model deployment much more robust. OK, uh, so that was a um, tool. Um, so I wanted to, to, to present this tool because I think it's kind of interesting in this context of human computer partnership, where we have different stakeholders, domain expert, ML expert, uh, or end users. That can be here, we have one person of each, but it can be a group of people, and actually it's what we are exploring right now. And, um, and yeah, I think it's, uh, it's kind of been an interesting tool to, uh, to, uh, to kind of uh, enact this, uh, this more theoretical uh, uh, system that I've sh I presented before. Um, okay, I would like to present quickly now the, um, the, last, the last part of my talk, uh, which is a project uh, that is using this tool and is using the kind of uh, approach that we saw in the first part of my talk. And I have five minutes for that, so I'll try to go quick. Um, it's an ongoing pro in, uh, 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 project uh, led by actually uh, Hugo Scourteau uh, and uh, in collaboration with uh, Thomas Similovsky, who is the head of uh, uh, pneumology department at Hôpital Salpetriere, and Samuel Bianchini, who is an artist and researcher uh, at NSAD. And so you will see why I presented this, this, this work. But uh, basically, this work uh, stems from the, the uh, a bigger project where we, we try to create breathing objects for art and health. So the idea is like to, to, to build a breathing, to build bre breathing objects uh, because they have this uh, breathing as this really, um, uh, is really strong empathy. So when you, when you hear someone breathing, uh, it can really calm you down or it can also stress you out. And the thing is like in the context of, in the clinical context also during COVID, uh, there has been a lot of stress by uh, people, and usually, um, a lot of old people that has been, that's been accepted to the hospital in order to be uh, cured. And, um, and since they have a tube in the, in the mouth, usually they cannot talk. They cannot express their fear and the stress. And so the, the, the project comes from there that we, we, want, they wanted, we wanted to basically build these systems that can be in the patient room and that can help relaxing or like focusing uh, in, uh, in the, um, in the, oh, with, like relaxing the, the their, their world, lowering down their stress. So um, this project is, uh, as I say, is a kind of uh, multidisciplinary project. With the inter there is a part that is interactive art uh, led by Samuel. Uh, there is a health part, respiratory, respiratory care uh, led by Thomas. Uh, that was the, what, what I'm going to show is part of a postdoc, uh, Hugo's postdoc, supervised by Thomas and myself. So more on this deep learning aspect and human-computer interaction. But then the project also includes soft robotics, computer vision, and music design. So what we wanted to do is basically, uh, in order to build breathing objects that can convey empathy, uh, we wanted to have expressive signals. And that's why we we started to use generative model, the same kind of model that artists were using. Uh, and so trying to use this inductive machine by providing data and see if uh, we can build a program that can be expressive. So expressive program means like this model is able, or this program is able basically to uh, generate a lot of diversity, but also uh, that the generative waveforms are also themselves expressive in a sense that they are conveying uh, empathy or, uh, or like a, some sense of re realism. And so we used 
and we transform a WaveGAN model uh, originally uh, proposed in the audio domain. This is our breathing data. This is our input data that comes from uh, Thomas' uh, uh, team. Uh, so here are like uh, people without any respiratory problem, uh, without d dyspnea, and. Uh, we can all already see that there is a diversity of behavior, respiratory behavior, and, uh, and actually there is also individual signature in each, in each one of them. So what we did, we took this thing uh, and we started to build, a, um, we train a wave GAN. Uh, say like this is like, oh yeah, we take, we train and then this works, but actually training as I kind of showed before, uh, takes a lot of time, a lot of iteration. And so, and also the WaveGAN have this uh, input that is really abstract, so we also plug a gain space, which, has, which is this, you can imagine it as a principal component analysis in the latent space that allows you to just extract maybe few, uh, few controls that are the more uh, uh, suitable for uh, exploring the latent space. So it's what we did, um, and what you see on top is actually um, the interface that has been built using Marcel. So here Marcel was really useful for us because as, as soon as we had a model that has been uh, built, we could build very easily an interface that allows us to perform it. So actually I have a demo, but it's almost, so I'm gonna show the video later, it's gonna be a, uh, And so what we did is actually, uh, we didn't um, work as HR researcher in our lab and then uh, deploy our model, basically we, we did this uh, system and we um, use actually assessment of, we assess our model uh, by uh, talking with Thomas, who is an expert in breathing. So there we had this kind of back and forth um, uh, relationship with, uh, with uh, Thomas and, and his team in order to allow us to say, oh yeah, now the model is good. Because we didn't have like objective metrics for that. And uh, once we have this, we actually, uh, in collaboration with Thomas, we kind of Explore. We, we sample the, the possibility of the of the of the Gans of the Ganspire, and we produce a diversity of of, of uh, breathing uh, waveforms that we gave to pneumologists in Hôpital Salpêtrière in order to uh, to see what they would say about it. So what we saw is that uh, basically uh, some of them. Uh, so here is in French, but basically they, they, they realize how they annotated with really qualitatively and they, they, they are kind of also focus on detail. So all this is generated by our model. And they say, oh yeah, look, at the, there is this little, uh, little variability here. It seems that there is something in the, in the lungs that, that makes some this noise. So th th this was very interesting because like, you see the expressivity of this type of signal. And then we also ask them to, to rate how artificial or realistic it is. Uh, we had also another, uh, another uh, quote there uh, that is basically, um, here what's, well, it's in French, but what is interesting is like, um, this person, this, this, this expert, this, uh, this uh, pneumologist, basically felt empathy already seeing the, 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 respira the, the waveform, saying like, uh, Impression désagréable. So it's like it's, you're not feeling well when you see that, and you are you are you are pro because yeah, there's something wrong. And or we have something really uh, um, really simple. It's beautiful, meaning that this is a sane, calm, relaxed patient. Okay, so I guess uh, my point. So here is like more uh, more. Um, analysis, but I think it's not point. This is the video of the system. So you can see the, 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 the interface that I showed you before that has been plugged. This is a, um, a machine that is used in the, in the hospital to, uh, to assist breathing. And so here we just basically visualize uh, the, the waveforms. And it's, it kind of feels already, yeah. Relaxing. <laughs> okay. So just to conclude, uh, I would like to 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 conclude th in, in three points. First, uh, to maybe talk again about this or stress again this idea of crafting under uncertainty. Uh, that is again something that is not necessarily uh, obvious. Uh, but the thing is, working with this type of with machine learning is also maybe we have to embrace uncertainty, uh, embrace surprise and accident. And I think. 
uh, from the works that of the artist is what they are looking for in this. Uh, so maybe as a HCI designer uh, or researchers and designer, uh, we maybe have also to embrace uncertainty and build less uh, uh, prescriptive or deterministic uh, interaction designs. Uh, also, I wanted to, to, to emphasize the fact that in order to build something, we need some tools. And, uh, and I guess uh, this tool must be also uh, built uh, through the community. So uh, that's why I, I wanted to present you Marcel. And I thank all the, the contributors to, to, the, to, the, to the library, to the toolkit. And finally, um, I would like also to, to finish by saying that in this, I mean, I guess, in this idea of rethinking interaction with machine learning, I guess here machine learning can really be seen as a tool, uh, something that you use to achieve a task or an objective, but also as a material you kind of explore, you kind of, there is like, uh, like uh, generated epistemology while working with this, uh, with this technology. There is knowledge that is uh, actually extracting from the use of this material, but also a cultural object that uh, the fact that we are using this technology, this technology is not neutral, is conveying a lot of um, cultural background. And the fact to use it, the fact to use the term machine learning or artificial intelligence is also uh, culturally loaded. And that's something that we have to acknowledge. Thank you very much.